What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary mindset. Our guest today definitely encapsulates that. He is an athlete. I, I like to call him still an athlete, ex-athlete, but still an athlete in every sense of the word. Founder of Everyday Athlete. He is a host of his own podcast as well, Life Rewind. And I am super pumped to have you today. Zach Tenora, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me, Mason. So I feel like a lot of times, you know, we both played football actually together at Lindenwood. You've played football, you've played lacrosse, and, you know, you've been in a lot of locker room situations, right? And oftentimes with the boys, you're kicking it around, you're throwing nicknames around, and you earned yourself the nickname Meat. So explain <laughs> to me how that happened. Oh my gosh, dude. Yeah. So, uh, really kind of a funny story here. I, when I joined the team at Ohio state, um, I really was like a nobody at first. Like I, I really didn't know anybody other than I actually knew Zeke from obviously being in St. Louis and like he played in St. Louis. I played in St. Louis. We saw each other kind of on like recruiting visits and stuff like that. So he was honestly like the only dude that I really knew on the football team as I was trying to make that transition. And um, I, he was actually one of the guys I reached out to initially when I was thinking about doing the transition from lacrosse to football at OSU because I was just like trying to get a baseline of like, you know, do I do I transfer? Do I stay at Ohio State? Like, what do I do? I didn't really kind of know where to turn. And so, you know, I just kind of used my resources and like talked with some people that I trusted. And, you know, he was somebody that I reached out to and he was very encouraging, you know, was like, yeah, dude, like, it's just crazy looking back. I think like literally in the text, he was like, yeah, you, you could play special teams. Like for sure. I bet like you could really progress to like, you know, getting on the field. And that was obviously like a huge goal of mine that I ended up accomplishing. But um, yeah, dude. So I, you know, when I did make that transition, you know, I really started at the lowest of the low. Like it's always crazy when I, when I tell this story, like, you know, at these big programs, you know, you, it's really like, there's levels to it. Like, you, you know, you've got guys like, there's probably like a hundred and, you know, 125, 130 guys on the team. You've got like, 60 of them that travel and then like I think like 70 or 65 or 70 have scholarships so it's like half the team actually like travels and like kind of participates and then like the other half of the team even scholarship guys um but then walk-ons included are pretty much just like practice guys um so dude yeah like when I joined the team I remember I was like you know I'm gonna play like I'm gonna ball out like shit's gonna go really well um you know obviously you're you have high hopes and then I got humbled really quickly. You know, it was very humbling where you realize just the scope of the talent and, you know, everybody that's on the team. And I remember like my first season when I walked on the team, I didn't even like get invited to dress for games. Like they would literally give guys, I'm not even joking, like tickets to the game. Like you would, you would literally be in the stands, like as a football player on the Ohio state football team. Um, yeah. And then, so I didn't even like earn the right of passage yet to like dress. So that's kind of just like puts it in perspective of like, where I began this whole journey. Um, and then dude, I just had this, like from the very beginning, I don't know. I don't know if I was just like crazy or something or whatnot, but like, I just like had this deep belief, like deep inside me, like I'm really, I, I'm going to play for this football team, like one way or another. And, um, dude, basically like, you know, first couple of years were really tough. Like, honestly, like my first off season was like, dude, it was just like chaos. Like you're trying, you're just like in survival mode, like just trying to like, you know, get, get to the workouts, get through the workouts, like not mess up. Like I remember I was messing up like so much in drills and shit, like in the first off season, it was just like crazy. Like you're just trying to figure things out. And so over the course of like kind of my first couple of years, I just kept pushing with it, kept, kept that, you know, fire under me of that. I wanted to play. And, um, dude, I got, you know, to my, my junior season, it would have been like my red shirt junior season. I was about to go into my third year um, on the football team. And I was like, kind of getting burnt out, dude. Like, you know, we, we were, you know, we couldn't even go home really for most holidays, like with the bowl games and stuff like that. Like our Christmas break was like three, four days at best. And like me being from St. Louis, it's like, I can't just like drive home or like get a quick, like sometimes I'd be able to get a quick flight, but sometimes not. And, um, so dude, I was like really questioning it, like for a while, like for a while, like thinking about quitting, thinking about like leaving, maybe going playing somewhere else and just really battling through that adversity. And I just remember like having some like strong conversations with like my parents and with even, you know, some of my really close friends at the time on the football team. Um, you know, I was just like, look, like I really have like no options at this point. I either got to give it everything I got, like one last like hoorah or, or I'm hanging it up. Like that's kind of what I told myself. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to literally give this like everything I got 
every ounce of me, I'm going to try my absolute best. Cause like before you're like feeling sorry for yourself, you're kind of holding back, like you're kind of just being soft. And then like throughout the time I was like, I just got to like go all in. I got to stop like having any reservations and just like literally go all in. And I remember like that fall camp, we, I was transitioning into that fall camp and um, I just started like really taking notice from the coaches and I would find like very specific opportunities in practice where I knew the coaches were like really watching and especially Urban Meyer. So like Urban Meyer was like a special teams like guru, like he loved special teams. Like he literally like he hand selected like who was on the punt team and who was on the kickoff team. Like he was very like hands on with his approach with that. And so I like was kind of almost figuring out, OK, like I know they're going to be watching this punt drill. I know he's going to be like closely watching this kickoff drill. And so I just knew like when I had those opportunities, like I they, those had to be like my best reps of the day. Like I had to like go all out. I had to, you know, show up like one of the starters to show like, look, I can really play here. And it was like one practice, um, you know, I, I had like a really good play on one of our starters and we always like would dissect the film and special teams meeting and urban would run it. And he like, he, I remember he would always do this with like guys he didn't really know. He'd be like, who is this guy? And like, he'd like point out the play. And like, so he saw like the one play where I, where I like really like blew up one of these starters. And he was like, who is this guy? And everybody was like, that's me. Like, that's me. And like, cause everybody called me meat. Cause I was so freaking big. I was like, I was like, I was like 235, 240 at the time. And like, I did not carry it well. Um, and luckily I like slimmed down, you know, throughout that the last two years, but yeah, basically, you know, he had me like stand up in front of the team. He's like, he's like, yeah, you've got like a real meaty face. He's like, he's like, I'm going to call you meat face. <laughs> and then that's what, that's when everybody was like me, like and freaking out and calling me meat. Um, so dude, literally it's stuck. Like that shit literally sticks too. As you said, like yeah, ever nice. since that moment, like he called, he literally would, everybody would call me meat, like literally everybody. And so, yeah, that's, yeah, that, like the... that's, that's the story. <laughs> Like the shining moment where you get called out in the middle of everybody, like yeah. the whole film room. And it's just like it, one of those moments <laughs> just sticks. That's so funny. Oh, for sure. For sure. That's hilarious. Those, are, So, you know, you had this transition and you're coming in as a, you know, red sh or a walk on and you're really trying mm -hmm. to, you know, make a name for yourself. But prior to that, you actually had a scholarship to play lacrosse and you were an All-American um, in lacrosse and high school at CBC. And then you also were all state and football as well, but you mm -hmm. went to play lacrosse. So what was that mindset of like, Oh, you know, I'm really good at this lacrosse thing so much so that they're going to pay me to do it, but I'm going to step away from that and take my <laughs> shot at football. That's yeah, tough. dude. Yeah. It was, uh, that was a really, dude, it's crazy. Like those, those life decisions, like they literally are like so defining. It's so wild looking back, you know, um, I feel, I feel like my life could have just gone down so many different paths, depending on like how I decided kind of what to do in that, in that crossroads. And dude, honestly, what hit me, you know, when throughout high school, I always wanted to play football. Um, but I always wanted to go to like a big school. I don't know. I don't know. What was it? What, what about it? But like, I just always wanted to go to like a big school atmosphere and like really experience what that was like. Um, you know, and and I had like my sister went to Mizzou, my other sister went to Purdue. And so I just really kind of like wanted like a bigger public school atmosphere. And at the time I was getting recruited by like some smaller schools for football, um, like some one double a schools and then like some smaller D one schools. And I really just wanted to like go somewhere big. And I remember, um, there was this, like basically this, a select team in, in St. Louis for lacrosse. And the whole catch was like, you know, if you make the team, it's basically like everybody in, you know, the whole entire state could try out. Um, if you make the team, the catch is like, you don't have to pay for the trips, which like for like club lacrosse at the time, like your only um, opportunity to get seen was to like pay, you know, a shit ton of money basically to get on these club teams to get the exposure. And like me and my family were just like, you know, like this isn't realistic. And so when this opportunity came, I jumped on it and I ended up like, really doing well. And that's really how my lacrosse recruitment took off. And, um, you know, I started getting like recruited by Rutgers, like Maryland, Ohio state, Michigan, um, like all the big, big 10 schools. And so I was like, Oh my gosh, like maybe, you know, lacrosse really is it like, this is the Avenue that's going to get me, you know, to one of these bigger schools. And so that's really what kind of enticed me throughout high school. And then once I got to Ohio state, like best decision I ever made, like I said, I literally came back here to Columbus cause I love the city so much, but um, you know, I got there, you know, my freshman year, it was very, you know, I was dealing with some adversity on the lacrosse team. And I just remember like, I was, I was watching a lot of like my CBC buddies, you know, playing at these big schools, playing football. 
Um, I started to kind of feel that like inner dissonance of like, did I make the right decision? Like, should I have played football? Am I, am I doing the right thing playing lacrosse? And I really thought on it, man, like it hit me pretty early my freshman year. And I thought on it for like that whole entire year, like, you know, do, is this really what I want? And so I feel like that was like one of the first times in my life where I really had to do some like inner work and like self-reflection of like, you know, who am I? What do I even want? Like, what do I want? Like long-term, like, what do I want to get out of this experience? And, you know, I just remember it came to me. I was like, you know, I just have to play football. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know to what capacity, um, but I just, I know I've got to do it. And that was kind of like just the confirmation I needed. And I knew my heart was like with the game of football big time. And, you know, luckily I had a phenomenal conversation with the lacrosse coach here at Ohio State where, you know, I I met with him one on one toward the end of my freshman year. And I just told him like how I was feeling. And, you know, he really respected it. He knew I was, you know, a high level football player in high school. And so, um, you know, he told me, he's like, look, like you do whatever you got to do. Like you have a you have a home here on the lacrosse team if you ever want to come back, which was huge, like having that. Um, you know, in the back of my mind was obviously like super empowering as I was making this big decision. And so, yeah, dude, I pretty much, you know, started talking with like Zeke and I started talking with my high school coaches at CBC, you know, they were talking about potentially like speaking with coaches that I was recruited by in high school for football. Um, But I really didn't want to leave Columbus. I really loved Ohio State. And I remember my dad used to like always tell me, he's like, make sure, you know, you're out of school where like if sports got ripped, like ripped away from you, like you would still want to be there. Um, And so, with all that considered, man, I was like, you know, like I gotta, I gotta stay here at Ohio state. Um, and really my only option at that point was like, you know, give my shot on the football team at OSU. And so, um, I really, I don't know, man, it's just crazy how, you know, I felt so deeply convicted, you know, once I kind of went through that whole process and it, it really is a general theme of my life, man. I feel like, you know, out of everything, you know, that I've kind of learned over the years about myself, I think like the one thing that I really do kind of pride myself on is just like, my ability to make decisions. Like I'm, I'm a very like decisive individual. Like when I know I want something, like I just do it and I go all in on it. And so, you know, once I kind of made that decision, I'm like, all right, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to step away from lacrosse and, you know, go all in on football. And luckily my parents were like super supportive. They're like, Hey, look, probably going to have some student loans, but <laughs> you're, but you can do it, you know, if you want to. Um, so, you know, I did, I, I decided to give up the scholarship and, and join the football team. Yeah, it's um I heard a quote the other day that reminds me of what you're talking about. It's, it says like the best skill you could have in life is shortening the gap between idea or ideation or, you know, thought to actual execution cuz so much can happen in there. Like so many people have good thoughts but they don't actually do it or they step away mm-hmm. from it. It seems like you at an earlier age, you know, made a huge decision with, you know, monetary, you know, p- repercussions and other things yeah. that came along with it, starting from zero, you know, maybe not being a starter, having to restart all of these things, fear of the unknown. And you went ahead and did it. And then on your senior year, you ended up carving out that role that, you know, you really found where you fit in on the team and you were able to be someone that could help the team win games. So talk a little bit about when you were able to gain a scholarship your senior year and how all of that hard work really paid off and what that felt like at that moment. Dude. Yeah. Like I literally just got chills just thinking about it. Like, dude, that experience literally was like life changing. Like you, you literally change, like you change your whole entire perspective. You change your whole mindset on like what's possible. Um, you know, I, like I kind of mentioned before, you know, dude, I had like this crazy absurd belief. Like I actually was like hanging out with a lot of other walk-ons on the football team, kind of like throughout that, those first couple of years battling adversity. And, you know, these guys were, dude, quite literally would literally, like, they would literally tell me to my face, like, we'd be hanging out on the weekends. And like, you know, I'd really be trying to like, get after it, like throughout the week, like in practice and try to prove myself. And like, it was just like a mentality with the walk ons, dude, like, you know, you're just not going to play like, like no walk ons played. And so it's like, these friends of mine were literally like, they would tell me they'd be like, dude, what are you like? Why are you even trying, bro? Like, like, what are you doing? And, and, and I would just like, I'd kind of like blow it off. But then deep down, I had this like crazy ass belief, dude, I'm like, I'm going to get on this field, like one way or the other, like, I'm going to, I'm going to prove myself. And so, you know, not only did I have that, that deep belief, but it also, you know, I also had, you know, even friends and, and people around me, even coaches, like, dude, like another thing too, is like, these coaches don't really care, like the success of walk-ons, like, obviously you can earn their respect, but like, they're motivated to play the guys they recruited. Like, if they don't play the guys they recruited, they look bad. So it's like, it's like this really, really like tough situation to be in as a walk-on where you're like, if you're someone like me who wanted to play, like, 
the odds, let's just say like the odds were very much so against me, like from the beginning. Um, and dude, once I like took that notice on from like urban, you know, I also started to surround myself with different guys, you know, toward my later years, which obviously helped big time, you know, kind of removing myself from, you know, some of those voices around me that were telling me, yeah. you know, don't do it. Um, and you know, I started surrounding myself with guys who I'm literally best friends with, you know, till this day. Um, you know, one of my best friends, Justin Hilliard, like me and him played special teams together. And like, he was a huge uh, component in like me developing into a, like a scholarship player, but yeah, man. I mean, d during all that adversity, like once once I started to take the notice of the coaches and, you know, once I started getting on the field that redshirt junior year, um, like that was obviously like a huge dream come true. Like literally within that, as I was transitioning into that fall camp where I was taking the notice, like I told the story about from Urban, you know, that's when he started to like put me on like the depth charts for like the special teams and started to like, I started to get some more reps like on um, like defense and things like that. And so I was really starting to like level up, you know, my game within you know, the program. And I literally was like getting on the field. And so that junior year alone was like a dream come true. Like the scholarship, I didn't even know if that was even going to be a for sure thing, but it was one thing I obviously wanted to achieve. Like I did set, I did set some clear goals like early on when I initially was walking on, like I told myself I wanted to get a scholarship. I wanted to play. Um, those were like my two major things. Like I wanted to get on the field. I wanted to get a scholarship. I remember even like, I was crazy, bro. I literally like wrote it down on a piece of paper and like literally had it with me. Like most of the time throughout my whole like trajectory. But yeah, dude, then once, you know, I got to my senior year, I remember like a lot of coaches were encouraging me like, Hey, like there's a good chance, like you'll probably get a scholarship. And, um, you know, urban really started to, you know, respect me for the, for the development that I was having on special teams. Cause obviously, you know, he, like I said, he was a big special teams guy. And so, you know, as I started to really find my role in those like team units and, and really started like playing well on those, you know, he was telling me, he's like, dude, you know, you keep doing your thing and you keep doing things right. Like you're going to get a scholarship, you know, on this football team. And, um, dude, it was just like the most overwhelming feeling. I remember, um, it was like one fall camp. It's like probably like one of my favorite pictures too, that I have, but it was, it was one fall camp. Um, my senior year, it was my last fall camp and, um, or I guess, it, yeah, I guess it was, yeah, my senior year. Yeah. So my final season, um, you know, he announced in front of like the whole team, like, Hey, like, you know, we're given a scholarship to, um, it was me and one other guy, actually another walk on who, um, was playing a lot. And when he announced it to the team, man, it was just like the most unbelievable feeling. Like just, I like, I was just like bawling, like tearing out, like bawling my eyes out. Like it was just like an accumulation of all that hard work. And then it's so cool. That picture that I was talking about, like they they literally like captured a picture when he announced it. And it's literally like my best friend, Justin, like I'm literally going to be his best man in his wedding. Like he was hugging me up. Like Joe Burrow is like one of my best friends. Like he was hugging me up. Um, and then like book, like all my like close friends that like really kind of were in my life during that time, like or, or surrounding me, like in this picture when I got announced that I got full ride scholarship. And it was just like, dude, the most unbelievable feeling. And literally from that point on, dude, it's like, you know, it's very evident, like why it's helped me, you know, in things I'm doing now where, you know, it just gave me that confidence, man. Like I can literally, it doesn't matter what anybody tells me, like I can, I can accomplish whatever the hell I want, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I feel like that's, such a catalyst for the decisions that you've made now where, you know, you are making that transition. And I want to talk a little bit about this because I think a lot of athletes and maybe people in general just deal with this, you know, restructuring of their identity after sports because mm -hmm. it's such a yep. huge piece of, uh, you know, who we are. It's in our DNA. And we put so much work and time into that, especially at the collegiate level. It's, it's a job at the end of the day, right? And so, when that piece of us is taken away from us, there is a huge part of restructuring. And I want to hear a little bit about what your restructuring of your identity looked like during that time and kind of what were some of the highs and what were some of the lows? Dude, absolutely. You know, I think for me, it was, it was really tough because, you know, I had that, you know, that peak, you know, I had that moment where, you know, I got that scholarship and it was like the absolute, you know, peak of my career. You know, I had people praising me, like, you know, a lot of people around me telling me, obviously, you've got a lot of people in your ear telling you how great you are. You've got all these people around you. And, you know, obviously that it can get to your head, like as much as it was, you know, we're just talking about how it's like the best thing that happened to me. You know, it also was kind of like on the flip side, you know, really tough, too, because, you know, once you kind of get that hype and you experience that that high, um, you know, once that's taken from you, dude, it's it's really tough, especially, you know, when you kind of dedicate like a lot of your life and a lot of your time, you know, to it. 
Um, it, it, it gets really challenging when that gets taken from you. And that's really why, you know, I do a lot of what I do now with, you know, helping a lot of former athletes, you know, in their fitness and in their health and just their transition um, in general. But yeah, dude, I think for me, man, it's like, you know, you, you got to be careful with your identity and like your character and, and who you are deep down. Because, you know, if you give yourself, like if you give all of yourself to something like that and you don't kind of leave, you know, a little bit of an aspect of your identity where, you know, you, you're very deeply convicted in who you are and you have that and like lacking that self-awareness. Like if we lack those things and we go through a transition like that, we can feel very empty on the other side. And I think that that's really what happened to me, man, was where, um, you know, once I was riding those highs and I, you know, accomplished those goals, I did, you know, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. You know, I got the scholarship, I got on the field, I did all these things. And, you know, I even had people telling me I'd play pro and like, you know, that was another high, you know, you got everybody in your ear telling you like, Hey dude, like now you're doing really well. Now you can potentially go to the NFL and so it's like, holy shit, you know, that's a whole nother thing in and of itself. And so you're just like continually riding these highs. Um, and then obviously when that becomes who you are and I let it, you know, I let that identity of the football player, you know, really become who I was deep down. Um, and I lost that self-awareness and I lost that, you know, deep conviction of who I was um, along the way. And so, you know, when that door did close on me and it did, you know, my when my football career ended, um, you know, obviously I had the short stint at Lindenwood and and that was I think I think that was really reassuring to me because it showed me like like dude you're done like you 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 gave it you you got nothing left like your body is like absolutely done though um so that was almost like it really reaffirmed for me honestly that like I wouldn't have made it probably that far in the NFL um honestly if I would have gotten the chance so it really did help me like feel like closure but um but yeah dude I would say you know we it's so easy to allow yourself to just completely you know, get lost in that identity of the athlete. Because like I said, you know, you've got all these people in your ear, you've got everyone around you is, you know, you're basically like, you know, a kind of like semi like famous to some capacity. And then you just go from that to really just being a normal guy. And, you know, if you're not careful, like I said, if you're not deeply convicted, it can really, it can really mess with you mentally. And I know for me, um, you know, I battled a lot of those things as I was transitioning into like my first job. I remember just being like, you know, damn, dude, like, I just miss that sport so much. I miss the routine. I miss that, you know, achievement of like excellence. I miss that growth. I miss all these components that were present as an athlete, you know, that were now gone. And, you know, what I found, man, was, you know, you really do have to do that, that work, you like really have to do that personal development work. And I think that that's what, dude, that's what changed my whole entire trajectory and changed my whole life. Because once I did, you know, transition into my first job and, you know, the, the athlete identity was totally behind me. It was really tough for a couple of years. And I, you know, I battled a lot of like, you know, mental struggles. I was really heavily, you know, dealing with anxiety and things like that, like questioning, like everything about my life. Like, who am I, you know, what, what am I doing? Like, what is, what do I really even want? And, you know, like I said, I kind of got lost in that identity as the football player. And I had to completely rediscover, you know, who is that? Like who, who even am I? Um, and so that was a big growth period for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I had a similar experience where I was the most happy go lucky, like optimistic person in the world, never really had a sense of anxiety. And if you think about it, yeah. as athletes were put into like these survival, you know, survival of the fittest fight or flight moments all mm -hmm. the time. Like our, when our parasympathetic nervous system is firing and we're locked into the flow and we're nothing else is happening, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But to have that outside of a sport or in that atmosphere, it's weird. And it's, it's, it triggers something else in you. And I remember in my first job in medical device sales, having my first like panic slash anxiety attack feeling. And I was like, what is this? Like, yes. Whoa, yeah. This is unlike anything. Like you could put me in mm -hmm. front of thousands of people and tell me to go perform and I would be as cool as a cucumber and feel so good, like on top of the world. <laughs> now all yep. of a sudden, like I'm doing this normal job, maybe not normal job, but I'm doing this job and it's like, why am I feeling this way? You know, and Dude, exactly. I remember that realization like it was yesterday. It was like, wow, mm -hmm. this is, this is different. Absolutely, man. And I, yeah, I feel that dude. That's, that's really what happened to me, man. Like I, I was like, I had never had those emotions before. Like it was the first time in my life where I was like, kind of like you just said, it's like, what, what is even going on with me? Like, I don't even really know. And I remember like searching, dude, it's crazy. And that's like what has motivated me so much to do, you know, what I'm doing now. But I literally remember like even Googling, like, 
is this a thing like athletes experience? Like what, is, what even is this? Like, and so, yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah. And I'm interested too, you know, what were some of the things that really helped you through this period of time? Because people listening right now, maybe some of them were athletes at the high school level, or maybe they never played college or athletics, or maybe they played collegiately or professionally. But even for anyone, I think a lot of these concepts really apply because we all feel these types of emotions in one way or another. So when you were going through this, you know, restructuring of your life and identity, what were some of the things that started to really help you progress to the next level and really cultivate that awareness? Dude, absolutely. So like, it's crazy, dude, because you really just have to get down to the basics. Like, you know, we go so long, I, I feel like, you know, when we're young, you know, when we're kids, we're so just naive, and we're not like conditioned to think anything or have like, these ide ideologies that we grow to have. And I feel like the world around us is so powerfully in influential on our lives. And I always say this, like in my stuff now, but it's like, if we don't, if we don't live intentionally, like if we don't put a lot of intention and purpose behind what we're doing, like we will let the world around us decide for us, like the, the world, society and everyone around you will decide who you are, if you aren't deeply convicted in who you are. And so I feel like that's what happened to me where I was just like, very influenced by society and by like what, you know, how men should be successful, you know, financially, you should drive the car, you should have like, you know, all that, all this crap that like doesn't matter really. Um, but like, I felt like I was very much so influenced by those things, very empty things. And it led me to those emotions we talked about. And I feel like for me, man, I just really had to look inward. Like it was really like, you know, a whole new idea of self-discovery. It's like, you know, I've become this individual that I don't even recognize. Like I've literally become this person by the influence of the people around me and society around me that when I look in the mirror, I'm like, I don't even know who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you really do have to like start to look inward. And the best thing, especially for, you know, you guys out there listening, like the best thing you can do is just drop the ego at the door and realize like, it's okay to like have those emotions and it's, and it's necessary for growth. And only through that growth, are we going to be able to live truly a happy and healthy life in all areas. And so, dude, honestly, something for me, and this is something I have a lot of my clients do, you know, if you are someone listening that like really does struggle with that identity and you're kind of feeling lost in life, um, you know, I just needed some sort of direction. And I remember, you know, there's this uh, website out there, it's called 16 personalities. And um, I don't even work with them or anything. So I don't have like any discount or anything like that. But um, I'm pretty sure it's like very cheap. Like when I did it, it was like probably like 10, 15 bucks. But this is like a crazy in depth, like full analysis of like your personality type. And you know, what's really cool about this is like, there's, there's a lot of those like personality tests out there. I think a lot of them are like BS, but this is one that's like very, very legit. And I just didn't really know where to turn. And so I remember finding this and I paid, like I said, like the 10, 15 bucks and it gave you like a full, like full, like 280 page analysis of like your wow. personality and career. Yeah. Like your personality and career, your personality and relationship, your personality and in, in personal growth. Like it basically touched on all of these areas of your life. Um, and it really just was like kind of my compass. Like that really is what gave me permission to like start doing some of that discovery of like, you know, what really do I want to do? What, how do I really want, you know, my day to look, who are the people I really want to, you know, be around and, and help and spend time with. And so, you know, that I almost like tell people like when they're going through that identity shift, like having something like that, that can just give you the permission to like redirect focus can be so huge. So I know that like, that was a huge piece. And then also like, just engulfing yourself in personal development. Like I started listening, you know, to podcasts, like what you're doing. I started, you know, listening and reading to books, like books that were in the personal development space, like reading a lot of like Adam Grant's books, a lot of like James Clear's stuff. And, you know, a lot of these like personal development gurus out there that, you know, really help you like push yourself to think inward. And it's so crazy, man. Like one of the podcasts that I listened to during that time, um, was Jeremy Scott's podcast who I was on his podcast, uh, not earlier this year. And we're about to, we're going to have him on ours, but, um, he was one that I listened to a lot that like, you know, he would always talk about these things about personal development and like really looking inward and finding out more about yourself. And like, if you're not happy with what you're doing, like redirect that focus. And so, you know, he, like every time I would listen to him, it always felt like he was speaking like literally directly to me. So I know like he was, he was a huge influence on my life, you know, like really trying to get me to like think outside the box and think of outside of what I was doing. So, 
yeah, man, I think, you know, really working hard to drop the ego and realize that it's okay, you know, to realize that you're not okay and that you need to start making change. And then just surrounding yourself, whether that be, you know, through the podcast or through audiobooks or through reading books or through, you know, groups where you can like talk, talk through th- some of these things, you know, just surrounding yourself with people, you know, who are going to encourage you and uplift you. Um, and really just finding out more about who you are at the source and like really doing the work to have that self discovery, I think, you know, can be so crucial and so powerful, you know, for people out there who might be struggling. Yeah, no, I mean, that's really full circle to be able to go on his show. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, um, I really think too what you were saying around intention is so important because especially today, more and more things are grabbing for our attention. Yes. And when our attention is scattered in a million places, we don't have intention. Mm-hmm. And so it's easy to get this jumbled brain of like so many things are going on up here. And how do I regain this focus? Like we hear more and more and more people are reportedly having ADHD, which I don't know how much I believe that as opposed to we're just the most distracted society that has ever existed, right? Because of all of these things that are ultra convenient because of phones, because of technology, you know, because of all of these distractions that we now have. So Mm -hmm. being able to eliminate certain things out of your life, like you said, people, things that aren't serving you food, you know, activities that aren't serving you frees up space for you to get intentional and do that inner work. And it, it is, you know, resources, like you said, where you can kind of see what your personality type is, I think are, are great. And then part of the reason why I even started this show is similar to what you were doing. You know, when I got out, I was searching for that answer or those things that could help me get to the next place and make sense of a lot of what I was going through. And so that is really a big catalyst for this show in general too, you know, and I, it's just amazing that so many people are going through it, but not enough people are talking about it. Yes. Yes, dude. And I love that. And I love that that is like that growth that you experienced inspired you to be this resource, you know, for people out there. And I think, you know, you nail it on the head, dude, is like, we just need to, we need to address this more. Like we need to talk about this more. Cause it's like, you know, in, in certain areas, you know, in certain spaces, you know, this is obviously a popular conversation, but then in, in the norm, I would say it's a very unpopular conversation. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, you know, we need to make it, you know, more normal to, you know, talk about these things and, and get out of our own, get out of our own head, like you said, get out of our own way and, and really open ourselves up to, you know, opportunities and to growth. Because, you know, I feel like it's like you said, a lot of these issues that we have and a lot of these, you know, mental struggles that we go through are byproducts of that, you know, distraction of, you know, getting so, di- like getting our emotions so diluted by, all these different things. And it's like, it all is really a mindset, man. And it's like, you know, it's, you really got to protect that mindset and like really be selective on like who you listen to, what you listen to and who you decide, you know, to influence your life ultimately. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. And it's, you know, what you're doing as well, you started a show. And so I want to talk a little bit about your show. Also life rewired, what prompted yep. you in the first place to launch this? Dude, absolutely. It's it's pretty crazy. Like I always, I don't know. I always just wanted to like talk more in depthly, like about some of these concepts. And I know, I knew like, um, you know, especially in this world, like we're talking about, everyone is very distracted and, you know, the social media is great. And like, like I obviously use it as a tool, but, um, I feel like it's just, it's just such a cluttered space. And I really wanted like a platform and an arena where I could just like, talk like kind of like we're doing now like actually like have that connection and actually have that you know talk and that conversation and not just like watch a five second video um and so i felt like you know especially through my growth kind of like you talked about like listening to guys like you know jeremy and listening to some of these other podcasts that you know really helped me along in my personal development journey all of that mixed with you know wanting have wanting to have these real authentic you know conversations really pushed me in the direction of wanting to, to wanting to do a podcast. And that's why, you know, I came up with the name life for wired is because I feel like I completely, excuse me, like rewired my whole brain and the way I approach life. Um, and it was really cool too, because, you know, when I met my now fiance, who's also a personal trainer and coach too, like, um, she always kind of wanted to do something similar. And I remember like I was juggling the podcast and like my personal training. And we both just kind of thought one day we're like, why don't we just do this thing together? Like it would make so much sense. Like, 
We've got, you know, her perspective, like the female perspective, my male perspective, you know, she sees a lot of different things throughout like her personal development journey and the personal development that she does with her clients, same thing, vice versa. And then, so that's when we actually teamed up um, and made it kind of both of our, um, both of our thing and uh, ran with it ever since. Yeah. I think that's super cool. What, what have been some of the biggest lessons maybe that you've learned about each other working together on this project? And then in general, you know, what have been, what have been some of the lessons you've learned from the show? Dude, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, working together on it, you know, it's really kind of opened our eyes to, um, you know, kind of our, our chemistry on just what we believe in and, and just how similar, you know, we are in our approaches with, you know, health and, our, and fitness and, and just life in general. And so um, I think it's just been a really cool experience. Like, kind of like I said, we, we were, able, were able to collaborate, you know, from a male perspective, a female perspective, obviously, you know, a lot of that crosses over from, you know, both sides of the both sides of the thing, um, and both sexes. But I think that like having having both of us together is just really powerful, because we can relate to so many different people out there collectively, um, together versus, you know, me just doing the podcast myself or her just doing the podcast. And I feel like what's really cool and unique about, you know, what Christina and I have is, you know, we both, when we met, like we were both on this personal development journey and we were both, you know, growing individually. And then when we, you know, obviously started dating and then ultimately uh, got engaged, you know, it just like went to like a whole nother level because we were already kind of like on the same page. Um, but through, you know, working together now on this project and then also like working together in our individual lives and our collective lives, it's really like expedited that growth where like, I feel like we've been able to take it to even like another level and, you know, having, having a woman in your life, you know, especially for the guys listening out there, having a woman in your life like that, that really levels you up. That's like, I feel like that was like, you know, one of the first things I learned about, um, you know, when, when I met Christina and why I knew, you know, she was really like my future wife was like, you know, she really elevated me. Like she held me to, you know, a high standard and really, you know, pushed me to be better and, and brought out the best in me. And, and I think that that like, that was just really powerful, you know, for me to experience personally, but then for us to experience collectively and just, you know, what we've learned throughout that process about um, just everything, you know, from the podcasting standpoint is just, it's really cool, man. Like, I, and I'm sure as you know, you know, when you go through these projects and you go through these seasons of life, you just learn, you learn so much about yourself and you learn so much about really just the world around you. And it's just, it's very unique. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you. It is night and day whenever you do have a partner that lifts you up and, you know, is a compliment to the things that you want to do. And you guys are on the same track and you have the same goals and vision and focus, because mm -hmm. if you don't know, and you don't have those conversations with your partner, it's like, you could be going in two separate directions because what you prioritize mm -hmm. is going to be different from what she prioritizes because your values don't align or your mission doesn't align or that end goal might not align, which you know, you don't want to be exactly the same, but a lot of the, those things need to be on track for you guys to, you know, properly lift each other up in the right way. So that's funny you started talking about it because I was going to ask you like around your partner. It's just so important. And I was interested in that piece from, you know, running the show with her. And yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. What do you think? I, I kind of want to shift a little bit into, into, you know, what you're doing on the personal training side, because there is so many different personalities and advice and diets <laughs> and fads and ways to train, ways to not train, recover, all of this stuff that we're consuming, right? And some of it's fluff and some of it's not, but it's kind of hard to see through sometimes. So what are some of the biggest mistakes or maybe transformations that you've seen with your clients? And what are some of the core principles that you've really put in place for their success? Dude, absolutely. I think, you know, you nailed it on the head, man. There's just like so much. I mean, everybody's like a personal trainer nowadays. I feel like, you know, you go on, you go on any social media platform. So it's very, I would say it's a very much so like cluttered space. Like, like you said, there's a lot of people with a lot of different opinions and um, especially growing up kind of around strength and conditioning. Dude, I would say like one of the biggest things, and it, and it really is like a principle that applies to life in general, but I feel like we've gotten so caught up in all these different things that we've heavily lost sight of the basics, like heavily, mm -hmm. like very simple principles. Like if you, anybody who like really knows what they're talking about, knows what they're doing, like within the fitness and health space, like we all are preaching a, uh, a very similar um, kind of set of principles and set of protocols 
that work, that are effective, that are efficient, um, you know, that, that, that really give you what you're looking for. But I feel like we've gotten so distracted by all these different things out there. You know, you've got, you know, the liver kings of the world. You've got like all these different people who have leveraged personalities so much so to the fact that, you know, it's diluted people's actual knowledge on like, what, what do I actually do? Like, you know, I remember a big motivator behind me even getting into fitness in the first place was like, I remember when I was transitioning out of being an athlete, like there was all these different diets, there was all this different advice. And I had to like, I basically had to make a shit ton of mistakes to then finally figure out like, all right, how do we even, what, what, what does yield results? What does yield success? And so dude, honestly, like focusing on the little things, like everyone is so focused on like chasing performance and like chasing the weight and chasing things. Like I've even trained professional athletes, like NFL guys that, you know, don't even know how to do basic exercises and basic movement patterns. It's like, we've gotten so caught up in like pushing performance, pushing performance, push the weight A to B. It's like, we've lost sight of like, did we even execute the movement correctly to begin with? Like, did we even use, you know, the right part of the body to do this? And so it's like, I feel like along the way, we've really, really lost sight of the very fundamental basic things that yield those results. And so like something I always tell my clients is like, especially in this world today where, you know, on social media, obviously, like you see everybody, like everyone cares about like the weight, like everyone's so focused and hyper focused on like, I got to lift this certain amount of weight to get certain amount of results. And in reality, it's like, let the weight take like a back seat, focus on like the health of your body first, because that's what's going to ultimately yield longevity. And that's what's going to have you, you know, lifting much longer and giving you a longer term ROI versus like sacrificing for the short term gain of like maybe pushing your body into, you know, a position or an exercise that may not be ready for. So dude, I always like work with my clients on almost like rewiring their entire approach, like 90% of the people that come to me, it's like, they're so weight driven, that it's like, let's just focus on like, actually doing the movement properly first. That way we can not only get the best ROI from like the stimulus, but we can also feel really good along the way. So I, I always tell my clients, it's like regress the load, pull back on the weight, focus on full range of motion, focus on a tempo. Like no one tempos anything nowadays. Um, you know, you see everything on Instagram, people just like flying around, you know, doing everything. And it's like, slow down. Like it's, it's going to help you. And so it's like really kind of getting back to the basics of like, Let's make sure we are working full range of motion. Let's make sure we are adding that tempo. Let's make sure we are, you know, using the right muscle, creating that mind muscle connection. And then, um, you know, obviously that's just talking about training, but I could go down a whole rabbit hole, like on nutrition yeah. and, and everything like that. But, uh, but yeah, man, I would say the biggest thing is like, we've really lost sight of the basics and the basics work. And it's like, if we get too caught up in the fancy shit, it's just a distraction and it's just going to keep us further away from achieving ultimately the results that we want. Yeah, no, Absolutely. So I think there's a lot of different ideology too around, you know, splits and how we train. And I know for me personally, my training style kind of really switched and changed a lot coming from, you know, performance-based training like football where, you know, I'm going to be making a lot of cuts. I need explosive movement. You know, my explosive movement is, you know, how fast I can get <laughs> out of the chair these days now. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> From somebody, too, who's also had two ACL surgeries, mm -hmm. I kind of had to transition and switch that mindset as well. And, you know, for me, I, I think my heaviest was 250 or so when I was in college. And mm -hmm. now I walk around at like 230. But it was one of those things where I really had this, like, idea for so long, especially when I made a position transition that, like, I need to eat, 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 eat. I need to lift heavy, lift heavy, lift heavy. You know, obviously we had more so of the performance-based training and that was our life at that time. But I'm interested for you, you know, you probably get a lot of clients now who want to lose fat and gain muscle, right? Those mm -hmm. are something women, men, all of us probably want some sort of that in our life. And, you know, while I won't say this is a one-size-fits-all approach, what are some of the ways that you have helped your clients? Because I've seen some of the results and stuff and the stuff works. So what are some of the ways that you've helped your clients lose fat and gain muscle? And maybe maybe some of the splits, because I know you have your typical, you know, bodybuilding splits. You have people who do push pull legs, you know, there's all these different variations. So what have you seen yields the most results? Dude, absolutely. So <clears throat> kind of going back to what I was saying, like there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. 
Dude, at the end of the day, like the fundamental principle of progressive overload is so yeah. freaking powerful. Like just being patient and like tracking your progress. Like luckily I have like a software that I use. I have an app with my clients where like they're they're able to keep track of like the results of the weights that they're using. But dude, progressive overload is like the number one way to yield like very positive muscle gain and and create adaptations in the body. But again, kind of going back to everything we talked about, like we live in a very distracted world where it's like people want to switch their workouts every single week. People want to switch their <laughs> workouts every single day. Like we want to, we want to do all this, all this shit. And like, we want to do all these different things. And it's like, no, 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 slow down. Like, let's, let's make sure we are tracking this progress. And, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, progressive overload means, you know, I have to just sit there, repeat the same shit every week, every week, every week. But in reality, it's like, you may have to stick with some similar movement patterns, but make sure we're tracking the weight, tracking the volume. So anybody out there looking to make change, you know, always be trying to manipulate like the load or the volume. I personally think, you know, to feel your best, one of the best ways you can progressively overload your training is just simply increasing the total volume. So like something I like to do within my programming, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, body part split where you're doing chest, back, buys, you know, basically separating body parts each day of the week, or you're doing like an upper lower split, or you're doing a full body split. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, basically you want to use like that, that template of like week one, you know, whenever you're starting something new, you know, pick us, pick, pick your movement patterns. So whether you're doing the body part split, upper, lower split, full body split, pick your movement patterns, stick with those, go like light in that first week, and then slowly increase the amount of reps you're doing, keeping weight very similar. Because what's going to happen is, you know, something I like to do, for example, with my clients is, you know, say we start at like six reps, you know, typically I always like to keep, you know, the intensity low in that first week where, you know, we'll, we'll pick a very moderate weight for like those six reps. And then next week we'll stick with that same weight, but then go eight reps. And then week three, you'll go 10 reps. Then week 12 or week four, you'll go 12 reps. So it's like you increasing that volume over time is going to push you into that intensity threshold. That's going to yield results and yield adaptations in your muscle fibers. So it's like, it doesn't really like more so matter about like how you decide to split it up. It matters more so how you just, how you progress those movement patterns. So like I'll have a client, I'll have clients where I'll, I'll do a full body split with clients. I'll have other clients where I do an upper lower split. I'll have other clients where I do a body part split, but all of those, no matter wh which way I decide to skin the cat, we're always progressively overloading the weight or the amount of reps that we're doing. And I think that, you know, a lot of people could get so much more out of their workouts if they really focus on that intensity. So it's not so much a matter of like doing a whole bunch of shit, you know, all at, like doing like 50 different exercises in one workout. It's about how can I do a small handful of exercises at a very, very high intensity. And what I mean by that is like, that doesn't mean 500 pounds. That means like if I'm doing six reps, if I'm doing eight reps, if I'm doing 10 reps, I'm doing it at a weight where like when I get to that, you know, last few reps, like I'm fighting for those last few reps, like the intensity is high. And that's what a lot of people miss too. Like a lot of, a lot of people, you know, out there doing very, very much so like diluted training, like where they're just going to the gym, you know, you probably see it at a lot of gyms you go to where it's like, you know, kind of just sit around, you know, pump out a couple reps, you know, you're not really that fatigued. It's like, all right, yeah, onto the next machine, you know, kind of just go through the motions. And that's how a lot of people train and, and it's not going to get them what they want. And so, you know, I think, you know, really focusing on progressively overloading your training in some capacity, you know, and I like to either use weight or, um, you know, total amount of reps. And then, yeah, dude, you know, really focusing in on that intensity is huge. So from a training perspective, you know, that is my best advice for anybody out there listening. Like that is, you know, that is what the science says. We'll build, you know, what you want to build. And it does work. Like you said, you know, you've seen a lot of the, you know, transformations I've been able to do. And, you know, it's all predicated off of progressive overload and intensity. And it's just, you know, how, however, which way I decide to distribute it, those main principles are always present. Mm, yeah. On the diet side, there's a whole nother wormhole, right? There's so many different things and you hear the 80, 20, like it's 80% in the kitchen, right? But what are some of the things that are super, you know, that where you think are at least very solidified in the approach, like is, you know, we hear intuitive eating, you hear hitting these hitting macros. We hear about intermittent fasting and keto and all these different kinds of things. Once again, so how can we kind of boil this down to this is something that is proven to work here in the kitchen to fuel all the hard work that we're doing in the gym as well? 
Dude, absolutely. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying with like the little things, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in like flashy diets. Like I was very much so caught up in like a lot of the flashy diets because like when you don't really like, when you don't really like know the fundamental why, and I think that that's the biggest reason why so many are so lost, like in their training and in their nutrition is because they're like listening to these things or like seeing these approaches, but they don't understand the fundamental reason why. And I think that that's like the number one thing, like for anybody out there listening, like always ask why, like you see, you know, liver King talking about these supplements. Why, you know, why you see this guy talking about keto or, or vegetarian diet. Why, you know, what is, what is the why behind what they're saying? And I think when you can find that out, you know, you'll find out a whole lot about what really matters. And so, you know, something that I was so caught up in for so long, man. And I know that like everybody is, is like everyone's so hyper-focused about like carbs and fats when in reality, like the number one thing, if you're, if your goal is like to like do what you said, lean out, gain muscle mass, there's two things that, that matter and it's calories and protein. Those are like literally the tried and true things that will yield results. Those are the, those are the fundamental things that you need to focus on if you want to lean out and gain muscle mass. And, and why I say that is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're doing a ketogenic diet, paleo diet, carnivore diet, uh, whatever you're doing. Calories will always be king. Calories is your energy. It's all a matter of energy balance. Calories in, energy in. Calories out, energy out. And that is what's going to yield weight loss or weight gain. And that is, you know, science. Like, we can't argue that. Like, that is yeah. truly fundamentally, you know, what yields either weight gain or weight loss. As much as we try to fight it, as much as we think it's, you know, this cookie's making me gain all this weight. No, it's like the 10 cookies making you gain all the weight. So it's like, <laughs> it's like the total, it's always that total amount of caloric intake that really, really, like, keeps people back from achieving results. And then protein, man, like, it's crazy, dude. And that's why, like, you know, I am a big fan of tracking calories and protein. I have, like, most of my clients are tracking calories and protein. I only have, like, a small hand few of, hand few, uh, or handful of guys uh, that are doing full macros. But really, dude, all those results that you're seeing me post, like, mostly all of these guys are tracking calories and protein only. You know, I'm a big fan of that because it does offer a certain amount of flexibility. You know, obviously, once you hit that protein target, you can kind of fill in the gaps with, you know, those, those carbs and those fats for the rest of those cows. But dude, the protein is huge, especially for guys out there. I can guarantee you, like if you're someone that hasn't tracked protein much, like I guarantee you, you're not eating nearly enough protein. Um, and I see that time and time again, guys will come to me and they're like, dude, I'm definitely eating enough protein and we'll start tracking. And they're eating like, you know, they're, they're a 200 pound male and they're eating like 70, 80 grams of protein. And it's like, dude, we got to be at minimum eating like one gram per one pound of your body weight you know, to facilitate protein synthesis, to facilitate recovery. And so it's just crazy, bro. You know, it, it's one of those things where like we get so caught up in all these fad diets and all this flashy shit because that's what, that's what the eyeballs get. That's what the marketing gets. But in reality, man, it's the fundamental idea of calories and protein. And if you can fit those numbers to your goals, you will without a doubt see results. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is there a direct correlation? Like someone who is wanting to listening to this and is like, yeah, but I want to stay away from the calories. Like I'm scared of the calories. Like, is there a way to kind of, you know, create that idea in their brain that this look calories is not necessarily a bad thing. It's the quality of the calories that you're consuming. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I think, um, you know, it's it, the quality really matters, man. Like we, we, we've been seeing so much science nowadays around like the gut microbiome and micronutrients and the impact that these little things can have like on our bigger picture health. Um, and so, you know, that's where I'm always encouraging my clients, like as much as I, you know, give them a little bit of that flexibility and freedom around, you know, some of those macronutrients and their calories, it's like, we always do want to focus on, you know, minimally processed foods, you know, foods that are whole foods. Um, you know, we're not eating a whole lot of processed junk and stuff like that. And so, you know, for anyone out there who's like kind of, um, you know, kind of skeptical about like the caloric approach, just think about it as like education, like think about it as like, you know, if you want to develop any sort of like intuitiveness around like your eating habits and nutrition, knowing like, and like learning what's in stuff is so crucial and important. And that's where like, you know, it's just eye opening. Like once you start to understand, like, you know, what is the caloric value of these foods I'm eating? Like, it's really educational, man. It really is. And like, that's what I always encourage my clients where it's like, they're like, ah, you know, like, I don't really want to track calories. It's like, you know, you don't have to do this forever. It's just a, it's a tool. It's a tool to help you educate yourself on what it is you're actually eating. So then down the line, 
when you do want to be intuitive, you have the tools in your toolbox to be able to make better decisions, you know, when it counts, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm interested specifically on the men's side of things. You know, we're seeing an incredible decrease in male testosterone and, you know, the way that I guess the evolution of men has started to happen and almost deteriorate, deteriorate as well. And testosterone isn't just for physical performance or libido or sex or anything. It's so many other things in our life, right? It's, it's energy and it's motivation and it's all these other things. So what are, what are some of the things that you've seen in terms of maybe the way people are eating or living that is severely affecting their testosterone specific to men? Oh dude, absolutely. I mean, that alone is a, is a issue everywhere, man. And everyone's like, you know, kind of chasing like the sim simple quick fix of like, you know, doing like replacement therapy and stuff like that. And like, I, I honestly, like, I don't know a ton about that area. So it's like, I don't want to talk too much on it. I think like, you know, if certain people need it, like by all means do it. Um, but I do think that like a lot of these things are lifestyle factors and it's like so evident that, you know, 90% of it really is lifestyle related. I mean, if we just, if we really like kind of boil down, like how does the typical male, you know, navigate their day? And if you think about it, um, you know, exercise is non-existent, especially, you know, as we get older, we get busy, especially as when we, like, when we start having kids, we start having a family. Um, but even like in our, in our work and in our jobs, you know, I see it time and time again, guys coming to me and it's like, they've completely, you know, fallen off track because what's taken a front seat. It's their drive to be financially successful. It's their drive to climb their, their ladder in their career and in their job. And so it's like, we're very driven by these like external factors that, you know, we lose sight of taking care of our fundamental health. And I think that, you know, number one, you know, we stop exercising. So you don't have, you know, the physical body moving through space. You, you lack that, you know, blood flow, that oxygen flow that you get from exercise. So exercise tends to be non-existent. Then, you know, we're overstressed. We're very, very stressed out because of our job. And how are we, you know, regulating that stress? We're typically using things like alcohol. Well, guess what? Like the alcohol is, is affecting your sleep. And so by the alcohol affecting your sleep, you're not getting that recovery that you need mentally and physically in your deep REM sleep. And so it's like, we basically just have this whole lifestyle created around just completely destructing our testosterone. So it's like, you know, <laughs> don't exercise, eat minimal to no micronutrients, eat heavily processed, drink a lot of alcohol, be very stressed out, low energy, shitty sleep. And then we wake up and we're like, why do I feel like crap? And it's like, that's why. And so it's like, you know, once we start changing those habits and I see it time and time again with my clients that I work with, like, dude, it's crazy to see the shift in their mental health and their physical health when we just start changing very small lifestyle factors. And I remember, um, I, we just talked about this on our podcast, but I was watching this Netflix documentary about like Jonah Hill's therapist. Um, they have like a, a, uh, a Netflix series yeah. about his therapist. And, and he was saying that like 90% of his patients that are battling depression, like the number one thing that like affects 80% of their mental health is literally just getting them to exercise again. Like simply just like exercising. And, um, it's just crazy, dude. Like, I mean, I, I, it's, it's wild. Like, it's like, we're doing so much of this to ourselves, but we're so like shocked. We're like, why is this happening? Like, why am I feeling this way? And it's like, let's just like, look at how we're living. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. It really is. And I, I feel like we almost touched on this earlier, but Sometimes when you're in this space and you're talking about this constantly, this is something you live and breathe, you feel like you're not, you feel like you're the majority, but in reality, like it is the minority of people that know about this, even live this way. And, you know, a lot of people are just ignorant to the fact that these things, these little things, these lifestyle changes, these things that we could incorporate or take out of our life, whether it's food or whether it's, you know, movement or whether it's toxic people or better sleep, like all of these things can be a very plus minus system, but a lot of people are just ignorant to the fact that they exist and that they can serve them if they start implementing them. So kudos to you for being one of the sounding boards for helping a lot of people in that area. Absolutely. But yeah. There's, there's one question I always love to end with, and that is what is your definition of success? Dude, I think success is just, you know, living completely free of anyone else's opinion and you living, you waking up every single day and living the life that you ultimately want to live, not based off of what anybody tells you how you should live, not what society tells you how you should live, but 
you being deeply convicted, knowing every time, like, cause we know deep down, a lot of us, you know, like to convince ourselves of, you know, Hey, we're, we're living this life for whatever reason, but you know, we all know deep down if we're truly happy or not. And I think, you know, waking up and having that deep conviction that I am living true to myself and I'm living a life that is completely aligned with who I am. I personally think that's success because if you can wake up and have that mentality, you will be financially successful. You will be successful in any area of your life, but it starts with that deep internal realization of I am deeply aligned with who I am and what I believe in. And I think that's truly success. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, I was talking, um, to Robert Mack, this guy that I had on the other day, he's a happiness coach, but he's been doing this for so long. We're just talking about when you come to alignment, a lot of the things that you want in life start coming towards you. You become like this magnet that, mm -hmm. you know, when you know what you stand for and you stand in that and you stand in that wholeheartedly and you really live that and you feel that every single day and you envision it and you see it. So many things, people, opportunities, money, success, all this stuff that we often chase mm -hmm. starts coming to us. And it's, it's a crazy thing. It's an amazing phenomenon, but that's really one of the biggest things that I want everyone listening to the show to be able to feel is that alignment in your purpose and in your intention. And Zach, you have done that uh, in your life and you're going to continue to do that. So, you know, it's been awesome having you on the show and I want everyone to be able to find you and hear more from you as well. So where can they hear you, see you, follow your journey, and maybe even reach out for some one-on-one -on -one coaching as well? Yeah, absolutely, guys. So you can find me. I'm really heavily on Instagram at, at Zach Tenor, and that's just at Z-A-C-H-T-U-R-N-U-R-E. -E. And then you can check out our podcast, um, Life Rewired Podcast, and it's on every platform. And uh, yeah, I would say those are really the main sources that you guys could, could find me on. Absolutely. Zach, thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Breathe and Air podcast. Guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, share it with someone who you think could get something out of it as well and then put it into action in your daily life. That is your cost of admission to this show. Go follow Zach along his journey. Check out the podcast as well. And again, man, I can't wait to continue to see what you do. It was a blessing having you on today. No, I appreciate you too, Mason. I love what love what you're doing, man. You're changing a lot of lives, dude. Keep it, keep it up, man. We need this. We need to keep having, like we said, we need to keep having these conversations, bro. Absolutely. All right, guys. We'll catch you next week. Peace out.